in a place with such tragic and twisted cases, it's no surprise that courtrooms are a source for many shocking moments. So from a hitman's testimony, to the father who forgave a serial killer, join us. Out of all places, few would expect deaths in a courtroom, especially ones caught on camera. In 2014 though, 25 year old Torgan Crips gang member, Sigali Angelau, was on trial for racketeering. Shockingly, as an informant was testifying about the Crips operation, Sigali suddenly snatched his lawyer's pen and sprinted towards him. After a years long effort by the Utah Media Coalition, including KUTV, a judge ruled the public should see this video. <laughs> On trial for racketeering, you see Angelau grabbing what was later identified as a pen and lunging at the witness testifying, then shots fired by a U.S. Marshal killing Angelau. I think there's no question though, you can turn a pen into a knife or its equivalent. You can take somebody's life with it. According to court documents, the witness was shackled and handcuffed. I think it happens so fast that it's easy if you slow down the video to maybe argue or suggest that there was enough time to do something different. When you watch it live, it's very hard to see that anything different could have occurred. Tolman says Angelau told the judge he would behave, so he didn't need to be shackled. But Tolman says this video may have the federal court reconsidering its guidelines in these situations. I'm sure that those measures are being reconsidered by the court as they look at it. The marshal was cleared of any possible charges, though Ciali's family argues that deadly force was excessive and that the marshal panicked. Meanwhile, another infamous courtroom death was that of Michael Marin, a former Wall Street trader. In July 2009, after a loss of $900,000 and with debts of $2.3 million, he burnt his mansion down for the insurance. However, police were immediately skeptical and Marin was arrested for arson. Authorities believe that around the time of his arrest, he secretly stored a cyanide pill. As such, when Marin was later convicted, he discreetly swallowed it. We the jury, duly impaneled and sworn in the above entitled action, upon our oaths, do find the defendant, Michael James Mayer, guilty of arson of an occupied structure. We further find this offense is a dangerous felony because the offense involved the discharge, use, or threatening exhibition of fire, a deadly weapon, or dangerous instrument. Yes, signed by the four person. Is this your true verdict? So say you want it all. Some of the most shocking moments are also the most heartbreaking. In February 1992, during the trial of notorious serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer, the relatives of his many victims testified to the suffering he had caused their families. In all, nine people spoke out against him. However, the most pain was felt by Rita Isbell, sister of Errol Lindsay. Though she initially contained herself, she eventually lost it, attempting to lunge at Dharma. My name is Rita Isbell and I'm the oldest sister of Errol Lindsay. Je whatever your name is, say, I'm mad. This is how you act when you are out of control. 
I don't want to ever see my mother have to go through this again. Never, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, I hate you, motherfucker. I hate you. That is out of control. Don't fuck with me, Jeffrey. I'll kill you. God damn it. Look at me, motherfucker. I hate you. What's your name, man? In a later interview, Rita said she was tired of the media describing Dahmer as out of control and wanted to show him what out of control really was. Meanwhile, a similar outburst of hate was also seen in a more recent trial. On June 1st, 2012, Lochlaise Kendall was working his usual security job at the Miami Lex strip club. At around 11pm, as he sat in his car, he saw 29-year-old Kawana Bird and 31-year-old Michael Smithers smoking marijuana in the pickup beside him. According to the pair, Kendall then left his vehicle and walked towards them, demanding they put their hands up whilst he went to inquire with staff. However, as he returned, he suddenly equipped his gun, firing three rapid shots into the driver's side, hitting and paralysing Smithers. Then as Kawana attempted to crawl underneath the truck, Kendall fired an extra eight shots into his body, killing him instantly. Such a case is already tragic, but was made even worse during court. On April 4th, 2014, as the trial focused on Kendall's mental state, Kawana's father, Donald, stood up and argued that he deserved prison, with the pain easily heard within his voice. Yo, my son is dead, man. My son is dead. He needs to go to prison. He don't need to be laying no, no mental hospital. He needs he need to go to prison, man. Come on, sir. He wanna play crazy? He wasn't, he wasn't crazy when he killed my mother and my son, man. He wasn't crazy then, but he crazy now. All of a sudden, he crazy now. You want to lay in a mental hospital? You do a murder my son, man, for nothing? When he was trying to get away from you. You, to, you, you were trying to get away from you, man. And you kept shooting him while his back was under the truck. You kept shooting him, man. You kept shooting him. And his back, his back was tied to you, man. He was trying to get away from you. And you murdered him, man, like that. You murdered him, man, like that. Why are you doing that like that, man? And you want to play crazy, man? Stop, 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 was responsible for the October 24th, 2014 murders of Sheriff's deputies Michael Davis and Danny Oliver. Incredibly, on only the second day of his trial, he cussed and threatened those in the car, stating his only regret was that he didn't kill more cops. As if the smiles and smirks coming from the accused cop killer's face weren't shocking enough. No need to prove all this be silent. These outbursts from Luis Bracamontes stunned the courtroom as the 12 jurors now deciding his fate were ordered out by a judge, but not before Bracamontes admits his guilt and lack of any remorse. Ladies and gentlemen, now step out of the hallway. dead. <laughs> As the prosecution laid out the horrific details, Bracamontes laughed, a mental state his lawyers asked the judge to reevaluate. The defense, meanwhile, not denying its client killed both deputies, but do say he was high on methamphetamine at the time and did not know right from wrong. But today, Bracamontes warned the courtroom and our cameras that he would do it again. Oh, we'll break up soon, and no, we'll kill more. Still, this isn't the only shocking testimony from the courtroom. In 2001, Carolina Panthers football player Rick Aroof and hitman Van Brett Watkins were on trial for the murder of Caruth's ex, eight-month pregnant Cherica Adams. According to Watkins, despite annually earning a $650,000 salary, Caruth refused to pay child support, and when Cherica wouldn't have an abortion, he decided to hire a hitman, eventually meeting himself. Though hesitant, he agreed to the job, and for the next three months, he collected information on his target's routine. Finally, as the night of the hit approached, Karuth invited Cherica to the cinema. When the film finished, a horror movie no less, Watkins followed their separate vehicles. As they both stopped at a traffic light, the hitman pulled up to Cherica's side and shot her five times. 
Watkins and Carruth then drove off. Somehow, the bloody Cherokee was able to call 911 and was quickly taken into hospital for an emergency caesarean. Fortunately, the baby, named Chancellor, survived, albeit with a brain injury, and continues to live with his grandmother. Sadly though, Cherokee entered a coma and died the next month. Concurrent to her death, Carruth and Watkins were arrested. In court, Carruth's lawyer, David Rudolph, dismissed Watkins' hitman story, attempting to prove he was the sole perpetrator. However, he not only refuted this, but threatened Rudolph. And uh, you've, uh, you've got a gun there that you said he told you to get down in Atlanta, right? He did. The purpose of that gun, according to you, is to carry out this shooting, right? Exactly. And so you get this call and you're, and you're petrified, and so you go over there um, because you're so petrified. But you don't bring the gun that you supposedly bought for purposes of this hit, right? Exactly. So you're sort of a hitman without a weapon. Is that what you are? If that's what you want to say. Well, that's what you were, according to you. If that's what you, I could kill you with my hands. Okay. Is that what you were? I could kill you with my hands. Right. I don't need First, a gun. This Watkins again answer. Okay, I didn't need a gun. Okay. And so did he say, well, you go on back and you go get that gun because I don't need to be spending another $200 and having Mr. Kennedy running all around all night looking for a gun when... I didn't need a gun. Okay, to, for me to kill somebody, I don't need a gun. Can't you look and see? I'm 286 pounds. Okay, I would rip you like a rag doll. Okay? Is that what you're going to do to Sharika? I could have, but I didn't. Okay, I could have killed her, the baby. Okay, that wasn't my beef. I didn't kill my wife with the meat cliver. I threatened her. Okay, I didn't hit Bridget with the crowbar. I threatened her. I was a dog barking. I didn't do nothing. I ran. How did you think I felt? I'm still human, even though I have a long criminal history. I did it all, but I'm still human. Still not all shocking moments are tragic or violent. In November 2017, Estrella Alexander Relford awaited his sentence for the murder of delivery driver. Salahuddin Jitmud, the victim's father, suddenly shocked the car. In a stunning moment, the 66-year-old Samba forgave and hugged his son's killer. So, if Salahuddin were to be here, alive, because you are one of who can to kill him, but if he is alive, he will forgive you. That's the way he wants, that's the way he is. So I'm taking, he teaching, he take the teaching of Islam at heart. So his mother has already died, and he's already gone. I'm only here to represent his mom, and to represent him. My dear nephew, Trey, I, didn't, I don't blame you for the crime you committed. No, I don't blame you. I'm not angry with you at all. I want you to know that. I wish I can go and hug you right now. To comfort you for the crime that you mistakenly done. Forgiveness is the greatest gift or charity in Islam.
in a similar case of forgiveness, as the relatives of serial killer Gary Ridgeworth's victims expressed decades of grief, pain and anger. One Robert Rule was able to forgive him for killing his 16 year old daughter, Linda. Before this, Ridgeway had maintained a blank stare, but when Robert spoke, he seemed to genuinely break down, a rare sign of emotion for a psychopath. Gary Ridgeway sat there stone-faced, as victim's relatives damned him and mocked him. He's an animal. I wish for him to have a long, suffering, cruel death. He's gonna go to hell and that's where he belongs. But then the emotionless facade finally cracked, when the father of one of his victims morning, appeared to Thank surprise you. him with a dose of human kindness. Mr. Ridgway, um, there are people here that hate you. I'm not one of them. You've, you've made it difficult to live up to what I believe and that is what God says to do, and that's to forgive. You are forgiven, sir. Those tears and a statement he made to the court later that day were as close to showing real remorse as Gary Ridgway had ever come. I'm sorry for killing these ladies. They had their whole lives ahead of themselves, ahead of them. I'm sorry for causing so much pain to so many families.